And good evening and welcome. Welcome to this fourth episode of Maternity and Midwifery Hour. My name's Sue MacDonald and I'm the curator for this, um, the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and these hours. And I'm delighted this evening to be joined by Kirsty Knight of Four Lewis and Claire Beasley, Bereavement Midwife, Heart of England Trust, who both are going to talk about their, what their experiences and their lives um, in a moment and, and as many of you will know these sessions were really designed to provide um, continuing profession development for midwives, for student midwives, for people who are interested in maternity services especially while, while the Covid um, epidemic or pandemic is in process because there's not many opportunities to go to study days or conferences or festivals everything's moved online and we just wanted to provide some sort of bite-size events for midwives and, and student midwives and a huge thanks could go to Mapflix, the video streaming from Maternity Experts and these, this is again a, a really good resource for midwives especially if you're going to do your revalidation for those of you who are that. I'm feeling very smug because I've done mine not long ago so I've used it, fantastic. And, and tonight we're going to have a, a discussion on loss and bereavement in maternity care, and especially with some thought about being at the time of COVID-19. Um, and we're going to, um, before I start on that, um, we're going to just put Claire and Kirsty on the spot to ask them both for a moment of the week or a moment of the summer. And they only can have one moment. And if perhaps I start with Kirsty. Right. Do you have that moment? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've got to say, as a family, we are always very busy, um, always on the go, and we've got three young children, and to be put into lockdown and just stop and be able to spend the time with children, that's, that's what's made our summer, but the most important one for us was sitting on the settee, um, getting the blankets out, and watching a film, and then making a camp and just sleeping downstairs in the sitting room, because that's what you do. Right. <laughs> Fab. Okay. And how about Claire? Uh, so my moment was probably of the week. Um, yesterday was a particularly um, difficult day at work yesterday, and hence I missed the sound check for this, but that's all okay. Um, and uh, it was very late when I got back home, but when I did get back home, um, I soon got back down to reality when my nine-year-old daughter was telling me how important it was to have her ears pierced, and it was all peer oh. pressure because everyone else does so. That sort of brought a smile back to my face after a difficult day. Oh, well done. That's some good moments there. Thank you very much. OK, now, before we start the session, I also do my usual discussion of uh, really of recording the Maternity Forum solidarity and thanks to all of the people who are caring for and supporting people who are affected by COVID-19 and also people who are, are suffering the effects of long COVID because that's that's been discussed very briefly and is impacting on a lot of people. Um, and of course, this this week has been quite a tricky time. It seems to be with the new tiered processes, you know, people are having to go under lockdown or feeling as though they're going under lockdown. It's not being called a lockdown, of course. And it's difficult times. So we're thinking about everybody. We all have to care for each other and just be kind and caring to each other. Um, and again, I always say this, but it, it's meant with real heartfelt uh, feeling. Thank you so much to all the NHS carers, all the NHS workers, and all the key workers who keep everything going. Your work is fantastic and you're really appreciated for all that you do. And I know people keep saying, saying it, but I think it's important to do so. Now I have some news. I always have some news. It's still Black History Month. Time also to, to carry on celebrating and honour the contribution of that Black Britons have made throughout our history. Um, and th there's lots and lots of things on Twitter and there's lots of um, materials on uh, available from uh, this site as well. So access if you can. It's also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We all, as, women need to know about this but also we need to know 
men are also at risk of breast cancer as well. So we need to make sure everyone's checking everyone. Um, and also it's Down Syndrome Awareness Month as well. Now this week it's in particularly it's Baby Loss Awareness Week, hence the topic for this evening. Now, before we move on to our two speakers, I just want to also say big, big, big congratulations to all of those who were recognised in the Queen's Birthday Honours uh, this week. And that includes Professor Deborah Bick, who OBE, Cheryl Lenny, OBE, Carmel McCalmont, uh, OBE, Marie Zygmunt, OBE, Ang Angela or Angela Gorman, OBE, um, Fiona Girard, MBE, Theresa McAlone, also MBE, and Professor Anne-Marie Rafferty, who's received a damehood, and also Marcus Rashford, who we've mentioned before, who's did such a lot of work in raising awareness about poverty and children's food over the summer, also was awarded an MBE. So well done and congratulations. And also to everybody who got awards, because it's a huge thing for people and I can't mention everyone because I've been here for quite a long time so if you if you have been awarded and you're a midwife and you think we should know about it please let us know because we'll mention your name next week okay now as I said earlier this week is baby loss awareness week and I'm really a very aware as a midwife that the loss of a baby at any gestation any stage in pregnancy is a painful and terribly difficult event for the woman, for her family, and also for the staff who provide care. And this week, because it's Baby Loss Awareness Week, it's a time to, to really think about those lost babies, whatever age they were, and think about, and, and, and I'm very aware that on um, Twitter, especially in Facebook, people have talked about the stigma of a lost baby and how a lot of mums, don't talk about their babies, you know, and, and feel as though it, it's not OK to talk about them. And, and I, I, I'm hoping that Claire and Kirsty will actually address that because it's really important that those little babies are recognised as, as individuals that were lost to those families. And so I'm really delighted to introduce firstly Kirsty Knight who's a bereaved mum she's a co-founder of For Lewis and and as well as being the founder she's um, a mum uh, she's also the charity director for For Lewis and a mum to Lewis Mitchell Oscar and Daisy May and she also has a partner and dad to the four children Michael who comes from Washington and works for Caterpillar now that is in, that's a little interesting fact for us to just think about. Caterpillar the shoes? I'm not sure. Anyway, so um, please welcome Kirsty. Um, and really the screen is now yours, Kirsty. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. It's actually the trucks, the big dumper trucks for Caterpillar. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'd just um, crack straight on with it. Um, I'm very nervous, I'm not gonna lie. So um, as stated, I am the co-founder and um, of the Followers Charity and a bereaved mum. And um, as a charity, we support families through miscarriage, stillbirth and their child loss. And I just want to start first with, um, oh, it's not working. Oh, there we go. Um, I just want to start first with introducing you to Lewis. Um, the story goes back to 2009 and I was... 28 weeks, no, sorry, I was 38 weeks pregnant and um, we sadly got told them words that you don't want to hear that um, there was no heartbeat. His story was a long one and we found out in the April very early on that we were going to have a baby and we got all excited um, as you do. We started planning for it and um, we went and got ourselves a house. Uh, we decorated his bedroom, it was all Winnie the Pooh, it was beautiful. My mum actually painted the whole thing by hand and things just started to progress from there with being a family. And when I um, hit 38 weeks, I thought I was going into labour. I started getting a lot of pains and that's when I got taken to the hospital and it was then brought to my attention that I hadn't actually felt Lewis move for over 24 hours. And Lewis sadly passed away due to a placenta abruption and I was taken to Sunderland Hospital 
Um, where the care we received was absolutely fantastic, given back in 2009, um, not a lot of hospitals had a dedicated bereavement midwife. Um, and Sunderland was one of them. It was a case of you've been on shift the longest, um, you, you, you can deal with a bereaved family. And our midwife was absolutely wonderful. She did everything she could. She took my dad away for coffee um, to answer any questions we had. She stayed beyond her shift signs until Lewis was delivered um, so that she could be with us for the whole process. Um, he was born on the 10th of December and he was perfect in every way. And the one thing that really hurt us was the thought of leaving hospital with nothing. We did get an ink print of one hand and one foot um, of the midwife and it was on an old fashioned piece of card and it just wasn't enough. Um, and we just thought we needed more and we wanted to create a lasting legacy. So we went out and purchased some clear cast kits, which is what started our charity, The Four Lewis. And this is my most pre treasured possession in my house. After my children, I would go back to this if my house was on fire. I really would. Um, you can feel every crevice of your little hands and your little feet on that clear there. And it's, it's just the one thing that I'd wanted when I first found out I was pregnant and I was making sure I got that because it was the only time I was going to get it. Um, so following on from Lewis's stillbirth, we had a funeral for him. It was all Tigger themed. It was orange and black. Um, everybody turned up in something orange. And I always remember I worked for um, a Muslim man and he turned up with a bright orange turban on. And I found that was very respectful of him. And so he's a really good, good friend of ours. Um, we held a collection. We didn't know what we were going to do with this money. And we approached the hospital and asked them. And they wanted a Moses basket and a camera. And that was it. But we decided that the families needed more. Um, to walk out of hospital empty handed just wasn't enough. Um, and we wanted to give these clear casts to every family. And I mean, it took us two days to source this cast. So we wanted them on hand ready which is where we developed our charity. Um, and we started making memory boxes. So we do memory boxes for early miscarriage, which is from conception to 16 weeks. And this is them here. And inside there's just various little items for the families. Um, so you get your two small teddies. And the story behind that is, um, my dad's a massive, massive Sunland supporter. And he got the 2009 teddy for Lewis when we found out he was still born. And he put it in his crib when we spent some time with him. And when it come to saying goodbye, my dad wanted to leave the teddy with Lewis, but he could smell Lewis on it. So he went out and bought another one and switched the teddies over. So that's why we decided to put the two teddies in the box. There's an acknowledgement of life there because as you will know, there's no birth certificate. Um, under 24 weeks, there's, there's no acknowledgement at all. And if baby's stillborn, you get a stillbirth certificate, no birth certificate or death. Um, we put a little glass angel in there, a blank butterfly card so mum can write, mum or dad can write a poem or a letter to baby. There's a tea light candle there. Guess how much I love you, boo. Forget me not seed so that the families have got something to plant and that they can watch it grow and um, nourish it. Also have our inkless wipe kit. Um, these are fabulous pieces of equipment. Oh, sorry. Um, we do these boxes in twins also, so that you get double the amount of everything to acknowledge them twin births. Um, so the inkless wipe kits are two pieces of special paper with a wipe, which is um, it's a dry wipe, and you simply just rub it over baby's hands and place their hands on the the paper, and it just magic magically appears. And for early miscarriage, it was a lot of people questioned why we were putting them in them, but this is why. Them footprints mm -hmm. there are so tiny and they are from a 13 gestation wow. baby. And then we also have these ones over here, which are perfect. Um, families will hold on to anything that they can get. Um, even the smudged ones are perfect in our eyes. And that one was taken at 15 weeks. And these ones down here, Again, you can see that some of them are actually really badly smudged. 
but to the mum that means everything and that one was taken at 16 weeks gestation so it is possible to do these ink prints um on smaller babies which is what we're trying to um promote a lot of um because the wipes are dry they're not going to leave any residue left on the baby's skin and it's there's no pressure needed i wish i'd actually brought one to demonstrate you literally don't need any pressure and it just appears and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so as well as the miscarriage boxes, we do our late miscarriage and stillbirth boxes for 16 to 42 weeks. And this is these boxes here. And inside these, again, you get your two teddies, your acknowledgement of life, your glass angel, the blank butterfly card. We get a tapered candle in this one with the box being a bit bigger. We've got a bit more play with space. Guess how much I love you, boo. The forget me not seeds again an inkless wipe kit and a clear impression kit an sd card for photos when we had lewis um we questioned if it was right to take photos of a baby because you wouldn't take photos of your auntie and uncle who passed away or your grandma but these are the only photos we were going to get um to look back on and the midwife came in with her camera and started taking photographs so we thought an sd card would be a great addition to the memory boxes so that the families if they don't want to look at them pictures they're not intrusive inside of the box they actually have to physically put that into something to look at there's also a curl box for a lot of hair but then lewis had thick black hair um it was absolutely amazing and a blanket as well and we also do the twin boxes where again you get two of everything you even get your four teddies in there for the twins um, the boxes have also been tailored to suit neonatal, um, paediatric and even adult oncology as well. Um, so that all aspects of child loss um, or child bereavement do receive our memory boxes. So the clear impression kits, there's been a lot of stigma around these. Um, some midwives find them very daunting and they don't want to, take, to do them because they're quite scared that they're going to do it wrong. So we find a lot of um, the hospitals, when they know that a family's coming in, they'll grab the silver bag with the clay and they'll put it in a cup of hot water and they'll leave it until baby arrives. So that means that the clay is going to be nice and soft and very flexible so that you're not going to need to put too much pressure on there. Um, these footprints here from Amelia, that was taken at 18 weeks gestation. Um, CEO down here, he's 20 weeks. We have Jacob who was 23 weeks and this little one here was 24 weeks. So they are doable on the smaller babies as well. We have heard of hospitals who, because we do understand that sometimes baby's skin can tear, it's so fragile. Some hospitals are putting cling film over the top of the clay once they've put it in the frame so that the baby's skin won't stick to the clay and then they can create the impressions like that as well. Um, as, well of our, as well as our memory boxes, we've gone on to um, look at how babies are presented to the families, in particular um, the early miscarriage losses. So we'll all recognise these, bed pan, specimen jar, a silver foil tray. We've heard some really disturbing and upsetting um, stories of mums who just passed a much wanted baby at around about 12 to 13 weeks and they've been brought to them in a, a silver foil tray with no dignity, nothing covering them and just put on the bedside table and went, there's your baby. These are not acceptable for families who are grieving. They are in the worst possible place and these are traumatic. Mm. And there's no reason for these to be used when we can offer our small Moses baskets. We also have angel pockets there, which are kind of like a sleeping bag, but one side open so that baby can be laid in there and the little ribbon at the side to tie, and that gives them the decency, uh, the dignity that they deserve. And um, we also do the larger Moses baskets, which are for, um, they're like doll size, so they're around about the 20 week mark. And we also have our small angel beds, which are up to 12 weeks. And again, they've got the little pocket in there, and they're more accessible by parents. Um, the the look nicer. It looks like you've been. There's a lot of thought being put into how are you going to present that baby to the parents as well? Um, so we also have our cuddle cot. And to date, we've supplied over 280 
of these to hospitals across the UK and Ireland. And we've even sent one to uh, Cyprus, the army barracks over in Cyprus. And these are valuable uh, piece of equipment. They're basically a mobile mortuary and you do have two mats in there, ones for stillbirth and you do have the smaller ones which are suitable for the smaller babies from around about 12 weeks. Um, they are portable as well and we do encourage hospitals to allow families to take these home. We took Lewis home, um, the, the cuddle cough hadn't even been invented. It was December as I said, so we were quite lucky, it was a really bad winter. It was very icy cold, so when we decided to take Lewis home for the day, um, we turned the heating off, opened all the windows and brought him home just to kind of keep him cold so that he wouldn't deteriorate too quick. And our family was allowed to come round and meet Lewis outside of a clinical environment. They were in the home where it was comfortable. Um, so these piece, these cuddle cots can be lent out to families to take home and um, they can spend up to 48 hours with baby and they're just invaluable time for them in their own environment and to be able to take them home means a lot to families. Um, but we also understand that um, a lot of things are needed within the hospital as well. So bereavement rooms is a big one. Um, so we are happy to help the hospitals refurbish bereavement rooms. This is one here that we've done down in Walsall. This is the neonatal unit. Um, this one here is our biggest project to date that's been complete. And this is at Sunderland Hospital and this is the Lewis Suite. And it's a safe, comfortable environment for the family to be. It's not clinical. Um, they can deliver in the room. And then once they've delivered, they've got a safe area where family can come, obviously not at the moment, but family can come in and visit baby. It's away from the hustle and bustle of a normal maternity ward. Because I always remember I was put in a normal labour room and the woman next door to me actually laboured at the same time. My dad um, and Michael's mum and dad were both standing in the corridor and they heard the baby cry from next door and they believed that that was Lewis and they're getting it all wrong. But obviously when they come in, my room was quiet. Um, so to be away from all of that going on is important as well for the families. But we also support you guys as well as health professionals. We funded many study days um, from putting your own places for various conferences to actually coming out and doing talks and um, workshops with our clay casts and dolls. Um, we do talk with a lot of um, hospitals and conferences as well. Um, so, I mean, we've actually put a midwife on her midwifery training. So she, we put her through university to do midwifery. She's just started her third year. Um, and she's actually a bereaved mum as well, and she wants to specialise in bereavement. Um, but thank you very much. Um, I thought I would just throw in a picture of the late Sammy Swood from Royal Stoke Hospital as well. Um, she did a lot of fundraising for us. She was a wonderful woman. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kirsty. That was that was really very fast. Well, it was it was fantastic. Um, and lovely to hear that you've done so much for Lewis, actually, and for babies like Lewis. Good. I mean, that's fantastic to be able to, to provide support for other mums and families going through what you go, went through. And it, that's really fantastic. I know we'll have questions from the audience for Kirsty. And um, so thank you for sharing that experience and also the work that your charity are doing really important okay so for our next uh, speaker i'm really pleased to introduce claire beasley she's a bereavement midwife and she's part of the heart of england nhs foundation trust bereavement team and this is a a, a fairly award-winning i think that's safe to say um team as well as Claire herself being a bit of an award winner as well um, and so she's going to share some of what she does to support women and families who've lost a baby so welcome Claire and the screen is now yours. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, so yes, um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been a midwife for 23 years and 17 of those years I've been um, a bereavement midwife. So I've seen lots of changes, um, all, a lot of positive changes, uh, especially more recently about awareness in pregnancy loss. Um, and it's something that I am really passionate about. Um, when you see the devastation um, of families, um, the whole family as well, friends, family, children, other siblings and on staff when a baby dies, um, it really makes you want to do your very best for the family and to let them know that, you know, you really do care about them. So, um, yes, lots of changes within our own trust to try and make sure that we're giving the best bereavement care possible. We are working quite a large trust. It's uh, part of the University Hospitals Birmingham and we um, have four sites. On two of those sites, we do have our own um, bereavement suites that we care for families um, right from the point that they've been told that their baby's died. Um, we also um, deliver in these rooms, so they're cared from, from the start through um, to postnatal care and discharge. Um, we look after families um, from 12 weeks in our unit to um, deliver on and we um, include stillbirths, um, neonatal deaths where it's end of life care from neonatal unit, um, terminations of pregnancy. So we work very closely with our fetal medicine department and offer antenatal support when we know a baby's got a life limiting condition. And we also are involved in um, sudden infant deaths um, when they happen early on after discharge. Um, so we're involved in all of that. And as, as well as that, we oversee care in our gynae departments and neonatal units. Um, and we're doing a lot of work with A&E departments um, now just to make sure that all of the families, whatever um, stage they are in their pregnancy, get the same standards of care that they deserve. So a lot of ongoing work there. So Thanks, Sue, um, for inviting me. Um, as we've, as Sue's already mentioned, it is Pregnancy Loss Awareness Week, which is a very important week of the year um, for raising awareness in pregnancy loss um, around um, clinicians and just to everybody in general, who I don't really think as, as um, a nation we like to talk about baby loss. It's something that I think parents feel that they can't always talk about. Um, so pregnancy, lo uh, baby loss awareness week is very important to other bereaved families where they're united and it gives them a very open space um, to be able to um, unite with other families. Um, this year in particular, um, I know they're focusing on um, the experiences of um, the impact on COVID has um, to, with the further uh, isolation that parents often feel um, when a baby has um, died. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through um, the session. So I'm just going to start with giving a bit of an overview around pregnancy loss and the impact on the care we as clinicians um, give and, and the difference that we can make um, and how to ensure that we have quality bereavement care for all families, whatever their loss is and at whatever stage in their pregnancy and also the challenges that we've faced in COVID but the things that we've tried to do to make sure that hasn't impacted on the bereavement care that we give. So as we've said, pregnancy loss um, is not a rare occurrence. I think we all like to think it, it is. And I think people are shocked when people talk about pregnancy loss, but thousands of parents each year will experience the devastation of their baby dying um, before, during or short, shortly after birth uh, or within the first years of life. And it's reported that one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage, which is probably around a quarter of a million people in the UK, which is a, a very large amount, and then an estimated 5,000 terminations each year for medical reasons. Um, the stillbirth rate, while it is steadily declining in the UK, is still four um, in every 1,000 births in 2018, and the neonatal deaths are also 2.8 per 1,000. So why does bereavement care matter? What can we do to make a difference? There's um, lots of feedback that um, the quality of care that we give bereaved families 
um, does have long lasting in, um, effects. And I think as Kirsty has said, everything that happened to her, she, rem she will remember um, forever. So that's why um, we need to make sure that we support parents through this devastating time. And whilst we know that we can't remove their pain, we know that poor care really does make things much worse for families. Um, and um, this can have short and long-term effects on their future well-being, their ability to function and care for other others as well. And also, I think it loses their faith in the health service um, for, and their engagement in the future. So um, it's, it's uh, very important that good quality care um, is provided to families so that they've got a safe space to grieve in. And I think as, as clinicians and um, as midwives and, and students, everyone that's involved in, in um, caring for bereaved families, we're, we're there to guide them at a, a devastating time in their lives where um, they um, can have unhurried time, where they can build trust with the people that are looking after them and where we can give them information so that they're making real choices um, that are time that's right for them. And it really needs to be individualised. Everybody is different. Everyone's experience is unique. And while there might be common themes within that, we need to really take into consideration people's own personal, cultural and religious needs because they can be very different. I think it's important to say that everyone that gives bereavement care should be able to do it with confidence and competence. So um, it's recognising that it's everyone's responsibility to care for bereavement families with compassion. Having few specialists to lead the service is very important, but we all need to take ownership on making sure that every family going through this is getting the best care that they can. As Sue's already mentioned, we do need to recognise the impact that has on staff and look after staff as well. Staff sometimes are going through their own um, personal things as well. So it's about recognising that and looking after staff and making sure that the most appropriate person is there. And, and for staff members as midwives and, and students to not be frightened to say, actually, this is a challenging time for me. Can um, can someone else do it today so that we're making sure we're putting the family first and they're getting the best possible care. And I think most importantly, from, from our perspective, we want a family to walk away from our care and know that we genuinely really care about what's happened to them and care about their baby. We no pressure, but we do only get one chance to get it right. So it is all about training and preparation and talking about our own fears about caring for bereaved families. And I think it's important. Um, I mean, we've heard Kirsty and, and 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 talking about Lewis, and that's invaluable for us all to to listen to. But I think there's just a few comments here about why the loss of a baby can be so different and why people find it difficult to understand because it's not. It's a different grief to the grief of someone that's lived their lives that they can share memories with. This is personal to them and they're having to, in the time that they do have with their baby, try and cram a lifetime of memories in a very short space of time. So these are some comments from, from parents. So it was a life that never lived. When I buried my baby, I buried my hopes, my dreams and all my plans for the future. As parents, we don't need protecting. We just need the chance to be parents provide our child with dignity and create memories. Bereaved, bereavement care recognises that parents' experiences and feelings count no matter what their gestation is. The most difficult thing for me was that I had, I had this love for someone that I didn't know. So I think that summarises from parents' point of view how different the loss of a, a baby can be and how difficult it can be for other people to recognise that. It's important to say that the death of a baby will mean different things to everybody. And um, the one of the most important things I've learned over time is never make assumptions. We're there to provide parents with the support, to provide them with information and to spend time with them to make sure that we, re they, we know that they really understand what choices are available to them so that they are making really really real choices with full information and that includes their families and their communities who may themselves have their own opinions about what families and what parents should or shouldn't do um, 
So I think the key thing is being led by parents once we've given them the choices and guided them through things, making sure that those um, choices are informed and that they've had time and that we don't make a judgment on that. We're there to support them in whatever, whatever decision that they make individually. You may have seen this around, but I think this is such a poignant um, picture to actually say it doesn't matter what stage your baby existed, your baby mattered. And we can't compare the loss of a baby at six weeks to a loss of a term baby because we don't know what's happening behind those individual experiences. So in caring for families at all gestations, We've seen families that are six weeks. We've cared for a family where the husband was terminally ill and the baby, um, they'd miscarried. Um, um, at, I think they were about seven or eight weeks in their pregnancy. Families that have had repeated attempts at IVF. Um, you can't compare it. Everybody is individual and everyone's loss matters. Hopefully you'll have all heard about the National Bereavement Care Pathway. Um, this it has been done in collaboration with uh, lots of charities. I think Kirsty has been involved in, in that as well. Um, and it's with the support of the Department of Health and an all parliamentary group for baby loss. And it's been piloted in um, hospitals and is now operational and it's, it's making sure that all families wherever they are in the country get those same standards of service so there are some amazing resources on the national bereavement care pathway but i think this um this picture here just really summarizes everything that we need to think about when we're caring for bereaved families if you look there are um, six key elements to what we should be thinking about when a baby dies um, and at the heart of that is the family the family are always at the center of that we need to try and provide continuity of care through all of those six elements to make sure that families aren't repeating themselves, that they have that root trusting relationship. Communication is essential. And again, it's always about being parent parent led. So those are the, the, um, the five pathways um, that we use. Um, and the, we have adopted these within our own um, hospitals to make sure that we are doing the best that we can for bereaved families. There are always challenges. The, services is, uh, the service is always evolving and we are trying to um, overcome the challenges that we, we do have. I think for us, sometimes we have um, a very diverse population that we, we look after from lots of different ethnicities, religions. And sometimes the challenge can often be with um, the conflicting um, opinions of what should or shouldn't happen between families, between different members of the community, and sometimes even between parents. So it's trying to manage that and trying to look after everybody that's involved. For some of our more vulnerable families, it's accessing the service and making sure that we're reaching them um, and making sure that they're getting that same level of, of service that they're entitled to. I think from a family's point of view, it, they, it's the definite look at lack of understanding of the impact that a pregnancy loss has them. And sometimes from, um, from clinicians within hospitals as well, and that can lead to isolation. And the biggest thing is, one of the biggest things that challenges we do have is this affects everyone in the family. So you've got bereaved parents, a mom and a dad, you will have siblings that have lost a brother or a sister that they much wanted and, and the parents of, of supporting those siblings as well. It affects families, friends, grandparents, and it's trying to make sure that you are supporting everyone that is affected so that they can support each other beyond the hospital as well. And language barriers can be a big challenge um, for us. So looking at what we've done within our hospital to try and overcome these challenges, continuity of care has been a big thing. We have an open door, families can access us um, at any point in time when we see them in subsequent pregnancies as well. And um, we're often their first point of call if they've got um, any concerns, and sometimes about things in general, because we've built up those trusting relationships. For us, one of the big things that's really helped improve our care is having our own mortuary facilities um, in our bereavement unit. As Kirsty said, the hardest thing for families is walking away from, from a maternity unit and leaving your baby behind. 
But for what really does bring families comfort is knowing that they're leaving their baby in the bereavement unit that they have been cared for with the staff that they know will still look after the baby. And it means that they can come back anytime they wish to, 24 hours a day. It means that we can facilitate quick releases for Muslim funerals or for any other funerals. And also helps us facilitate taking babies, um, families who want to take their babies home. I think we have families phoning up sometimes at night time just for us to go and check on their baby and make sure their baby's okay. We've had families that come back in and read bedtime stories in the quiet room with the lights and the candle on. It has really changed the way that we provide our service and I would advocate it um, in, in, in all units. For families where, um, for any, even early miscarriages, we um, will look after them via the, the um, gynae unit and we will, um, if they want to take their baby home, we will do that from our bereavement unit as well. We, we've worked really closely in collaboration with our chaplaincy team and our community faith leaders to make sure that we're making our service multi-faith. And I think at the moment it's particularly important to just reiterate um, the support service that um, is available. Just to mention about COVID, there has been a lot of challenges with COVID, with restrictions to visiting, wearing uh, PPE and isolation, which has really complicated the grief for some families and also needing to provide extra staff support. Um, but there are some resources out there which, shared on, which is shared in this presentation. And I think it's just really important that we spend more time to communicate with families, still smile behind the mask, take extra time. Um, we facilitated lots of fam families taking their babies home more, which has been a positive thing for families so they can still share um, their babies with their families. And we've also just made sure that we're signposting to support services um, doing extra memory building for families, um, grandparents and families and friends so that they've got physical memories as well and encouraging families to FaceTime in the absence of having their families around them um, and we've attended um, scans for families with subsequent pregnancies when their partners haven't been around. This is a really good resource to um, look into after, after this. Um, and still get feedback from families, look into how you can improve your service all the time. We've Kirsty mentioned photos. Um, photos have been particularly um, beneficial during this time of COVID where we've taken lots of extra pictures, um, as many as we possibly can so that the families have got those to reflect on and share with families. And just really to end, I just wanted to show you our garden of remembrance that um, has really been of benefit to us in COVID as well. It's an extra space outside where, where families have been able to take their babies into the garden and um, has just been an, an, a lovely extra space. And we have facilitated some grandparents seeing their babies as well um, in that outside space. So that's been of real benefit to us um, as well. Um, and I think just to, just to end with, you know, families, are not alone we're all here um, together to try and, and do the best that we can to make sure bereavement care is the best it can be thank you fantastic thank you so much i think we're very privileged to have had both you claire and kirsty joining us this evening and i know it's a, a so such a huge area and you've only been we've only given you a little time for both of you and I'm sorry that we can, can't have longer but I think you've both kind of in, encapsulated the issues that are really important you've really given the voice of the mums and the voice of the midwives and kind of brought them really well together so thank you so much for, for doing that I know we've had a lot of very positive comments now I'm looking this way because I have two screens and the audience will know this if they've been before. And that's where the questions come in. And I know we had a, a comment, no questions yet, but loads of positive comments for Kirsty. So that was that far. That was a wee bit earlier. Um, and I do have a question um, from Cheryl Turner. Hi, Cheryl. 
And she says, I'm wanting to continue to develop my knowledge surrounding baby loss as a midwife. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. And ultimately, I'd love to be a bereavement midwife in the near future. What advice do you have to progress in this area? I think that's definitely for you, Claire. But maybe Kirsty would have a comment, being as that experience of supporting the student midwife through. I, I think it's about caring for as many bereaved families as you can and increasing your experience. With, with your experience, your knowledge will grow, your confidence will grow. Try and get senior or more experienced people with you to support you while you do that so that you're constantly um, learning and tap into all of the resources that are out there. The National Bereavement Care Pathway has got some amazing resources and most importantly, learn from families. Fabulous, thank you. How about Kirsty? Um, I don't think there's much more I can add. You know, the, the families is the, the main important thing to mm. learn from. Um, attend as many training days and study like this that you can just to pick up as much information. And um, there's a lot of fantastic resources out there and a lot of people who will be willing to support you and help with finding things out and bettering that knowledge for you. Fabulous. Thank you. The other thing I should mention is we do have an information resources sheet and some of the resources that Claire and Kirsty have talked about, including the websites, are on here. So those will be available through the website. Um, I think I mean, I think it's it's interesting what you're saying about getting lots of experience. I know sometimes as students, students get quite protected. And I, I think from my own experience, you need you need to kind of put yourself forward a bit and kind of be brave to think about it because it's it is quite scary to kind of make that step into caring for someone who's lost a baby or losing a baby or you you know you're delivering a stillborn baby and i think having a, a very experienced and compassionate practitioner supporting and letting you do things but supporting you and helping you use the words that or not words actually you, you know that you, you don't have to do all the talking is really helpful so thank you for that that you've just said now I'm, I'm coming again here um and Adele Tracy hello Adele uh who says hi Claire I'm a student in the West Midlands and be very interested in spending some of my elective placement with you is that possible now this 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 student is a very clever student. Well done, Edel. <laughs> yeah, so I think we're very fortunate that we have got our own dedicated bereavement unit. Um, so uh, we do have students rotate in into the bereavement unit all the time and newly qualified midwives as well as part of their preceptorship, which has been quite a new thing. But the students that are here are able to watch, see what happens, learn how how to care for bereaved families and it's the best time to get that experience so we would welcome um, anyone any students coming here to get experience um, and actually on a positive note when they're then on delivery suite some of our newly qualified staff that have, have rotated into our unit are sometimes the first ones to say they'll care for the families because they want to they want to do it they want to go and give that best care that they can which is really positive Fabulous. Thank you, Claire. That's lovely. And I've got another comment from Mary Lynch. Hi, Mary, who says, I cannot express how much benefit four Lewis memory boxes have supported the bereaved parents at North Bristol NHS Trust. So grateful. Thank you. So I think that's a, a round of applause for Kirsty and her charity. Well done for that. OK, I've got I, I did. I mean, you were talking about a little bit, Claire, about religious and cultural needs and kind of supporting parents I mean I was interested when you said there's sometimes a kind of and I picked it up as a dislocation between in the family maybe because yes. I mean maybe one one religion says this is what you should do I know there was there was a publication years ago about different religions and how they deal with death and what I learned as a practitioner is you, you have to chuck that away, really, and you have to yeah. check out for the mother. And her religion may not say what she is feeling she'd like to do, but maybe you'd, you could expand on that a little. 
Yeah, so we we do experience that um, quite a bit, to be honest. Sometimes, um, so for instance, we may have a, a Muslim family and the mom really wants memory building, but the family are encouraging her not to have that because they don't think she should have that. I don't think there's anything in from a religious perspective, but culturally they, you know, they expressed that they didn't want her to have that. So it was about then speaking to the mom when she was on her own to say, actually, what do you want? How can we overcome this? Would it be possible for us to do the memory box for you and you take that home and put that somewhere safe at home? It's things, it's things like that. And even attending funerals, um, a lot at Muslim funerals it is normally the the dads the the males that go but now we are seeing that moms go so I think it's about not just yeah. making that assumption or well, sometimes I've, I've heard even moms with elders sort of say that we, we've pulled up and we've just parked up and so that we're close so it, I think it's about just not making assumptions oh you're not going to the funeral then it's like are you going to the funeral is that what you want to do and just just being very open-minded and just make sure that you give everyone those same choices without making any assumptions but it can be a challenge particularly when you feel that um so for instance when we have the muslim funeral directors that are coming to take the baby to go to the mosque prior to the funeral so there is a time pressure but the mom's still there holding the baby and doesn't want to let let the baby go so we you know sometimes we will say can you just give us another half an hour because the family want that wants um, to spend more time with the baby that she can never, you know, they can never get back. So sometimes it's just about facilitating things, but making sure that you're keeping um, the, the choices of trying to accommodate what everyone um, wants, really. No, that's really good. I think that not making assumptions is a fantastic thing to have in the back of your mind at all times. That's fantastic. I'm just checking more questions. I've got, oh, I think this might be what, again, for you, Claire. Eleanor Walsh says, can I please get clarification? Do you get a birth certificate if you have a stillborn baby? I'm a qualified health visitor and this has been brilliant. Thank you. I think I know the answer, but I'll let you do the answer, Claire. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> baby um, that is stillborn is over 24 weeks with no signs of life. And they uh, stillborn babies are legally registrable in this country. So they will get a certificate of stillbirth. It's not a birth and death. It's a stillbirth certificate. So, yeah, any baby born over 24 weeks with no signs of life will get a stillbirth certificate. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you very much. Now, I've got uh, a, a comment from Lola Atika Onato, who says, thank you for your presentation and all your hard work, Kirsty. I just wanted to add that in some cultures, it's quite taboo to take handprints and footprints or a lock of hair. And some parents may find this upsetting if offered. So as midwives, we need to be culturally sensitive aware and aware. I don't know if that's something, Kirsty, have you, have you, know, have you kind of men, met that before? Um, that one in particular about the handprint and the hair, no, I've not had that one um, said before, and um, that's new to us. Um, we have found culturally the main one we've seen is the glass angel, in particular with Muslim um, Muslim cultures. Yeah. Um, but we always say to the midwives, offer the family the memory box, and they are welcome to remove whatever they do not want. Yeah. But even saying that, going back to what you were saying there, Claire, as well, um, we've known where either the Muslim mum or dad have actually took that glass angel and popped it in the pocket yeah. and took it away. Yeah. Um, so it really is, yeah, they're all bound by a culture or a faith, but mm. they're also an individual. So they will let you know what they want if you ask that question. Mm. And I think that's beautifully put, actually, Kirsty. Thank you for that. I think that's really important for us to, to kind of recognise that each individual... And like Claire said, we don't know what that birth means to that family in that particular point. I mean, it was, I was quite, um, I was actually, Kirsty, I was really shocked when you did the images of the, the metal dishes and, and all of that before. And I kind of, I'm assuming that that was quite a long time ago, but is that correct? Um, we still hear of it happening um, now and then it, it is mainly on gynecology wards because we do yeah. understand that 
it's not a fixed set of staff who work on that ward. It's a lot of staff from various different areas. Yeah. So they're not, some of them might come um, just um, to fill in for a member of staff on sick. So they don't know what the policies and what's available within that ward. Um, but we do hear about it a lot. Um, in particular, the bedpan with the babies lined up in sluice and things. Um, so we do get a lot of distressing stories yeah. too from early miscarriage families. Because there's still there is still some work to do there, I think, isn't there? Because I mean, even uh, you you might have, and it, it's again perhaps people making assumptions, because there may be babies who've been born after a termination where, you know, the staff don't realise that that's still important to the family. Yeah, so I think it's so we still work need to work because I I know I found I always find that sort of thing quite shocking because I can't imagine doing that but it has happened in the past and we always need to be aware of the need to educate our colleagues and be very aware of what goes on so thank you for that and the um i mean i was i was really interested in the the cuddle cot as well and that then then claire kind of sort of fed that into her session about um making sure that the mothers have access to their babies and can take their babies home and i think that, the cuddle cot, I'm, you know, that's a new one for me, funnily enough, but that was really interesting. So thank you for that. Aha, I have another question coming through, just come through. From Edith Kay, and she says, when a family are grieving, not only the loss of the baby, but also the mother, do you have any advice for clinicians on the most important of aspects of caring for the family? So I'm assuming that Edith might mean a maternal mortality and maternal death as well as a, the loss of a baby. Gosh, that's a big that's a big issue, isn't it? Yeah, we um, we have we do look after families. We have looked after um, cases where sadly the mum and the baby has died, um, and um, obviously that's a, a different lots of different issues there because most of those um, cases will be coroner's cases as well but again it's still taking all those uh, well we have to bear in mind while there's le legal um, requirements and legal aspects to that and processes we do have to follow it's put remembering that there's a family and um, behind all of that and making sure that we can still do memory building for a baby it's just about getting permission from the coroners and um, we, we've taken fingerprints of of the mom so that other siblings have got remind you know little memories of their mom as well as their their sibling as well um but yes that's a um it, it's it's a it's grief of a baby and the you know the loss of a a, a daughter or a, a mm. wife um and that is very complicated and needs lots of lots of lots of support mm. and again all those signposting of supports for um, grief and 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 uh, lots of different types of counselling that may be appropriate. Mm. And also, I mean, that makes makes one think about the pressure on the staff, because I mean, if you you have a a mother that dies as well as a baby, that's very hard on the staff to cope with as well as the family. So you've got you know it's it's one of these. Um, issues that we expect maternity and midwifery to be happy places mm. we expect to have a happy mum and a happy live baby and then this is almost like um emphasizing how transient life is actually quite i think that's reflective of, of baby loss though because when you tell people you're a midwife people will always say oh what a lovely job um you know mm. how lovely but they never ever think about the fact that there's a very different side to that um, mm. and that actually not all families will have um, a baby that they they take home and when you see the figures that I put up there that just mm. shows you how many people are affected by pregnancy loss and whilst that is in the maternity unit that that staff as well you know we're mm. there's a lot of women within um hospital setting that's lots of women as well that may be going through their own personal experiences as well so it's being mindful of all of that I think within a service I think that's that's fantastic thank you Claire I don't know Kirsty, if you wanted to have a final word 
Um, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm just I'm I think, everything that's been said. I think, Kirsty and, and Claire, you're more than okay. You've been absolutely fantastic. And sadly, we've run out of time. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing both of your experience and your knowledge and, and all the things that you've experienced you know you've shared this evening have been fantastic and I think has really will help practitioners to think about what they're doing not make assumptions and think about trying to make the, the, the memories even to the point of the little wax uh, handprint and feet prints which is was really helpful um, now some of us will be on social media to answer any questions there's still a few questions have come in um, there are resources available, just as a little bit of reading matter for anybody. There's uh, fantastic resources to be, to be accessed. Um, and next week, I just want to say next week, we've got a Continuity of Care Oktoberfest. Now, most people will think about Oktoberfest and will think of beer. But no, we're going to talk about Continuity of Care because we're midwives and we're student midwives. And we have Mel Radford and Anna Byram from UCLan. So that's going to be fantastic. Also, just to highlight that the Scottish Midwifery and Maternity Festival is live and on demand 25th of November, all online, got some fantastic speakers. So book now. Um, and all it, it remains for me to say is just another big thank you to Claire and Kirsty who've been so generous with their time and their, their, everything that they've done this evening. It's been fantastic, so thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for coming and attending and listening and some fantastic questions and comments. And in the meantime, till next week, stay safe and stay well and keep your loved ones close to you. Thank you, night night. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.